Welcome, beautiful vegans. Welcome to Empowered Vegans, the show that inspires and empowers vegans to live their best lives, hosted by me, vegan empowerment coach, Marikita Solis. Each week, I feature leading experts in the vegan and plant-based world, sharing inspiring stories, practical tips, and empowering conversations. My mission is to support the vegan community in living a fulfilling, joyful life while making a positive impact on the world. As a transformational coach, I also offer coaching programs to help vegans navigate challenges and create a life that aligns with their values. And I'm starting a coaching program soon in November. We're looking at animal wisdom and how we can use animal wisdom to become more effective, peaceful advocates. So today, please make sure that you give StreamYard permission to use your name. And I wanna see a lot of comments and questions because we've got a great guest at a special time, Lauren Lockman, the founder of Tanglewood Wellness Center. And he's got an incredible story of health and really rebounding from illness. And I'm excited that he's here today. He's on the road traveling, so he's made time for us. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much, Marikita. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, I'm excited. I mean, I saw you on JJ's program on her Vegan Knowledge channel. And she said, you got to get Lauren on. And I said, you're right, I do. So wonderful. Well, I'd love to hear, let's start out with your story. How, uh, what, what, what brought you to where you are today? Sure. You know, it's, it's probably a fairly common story. Um, I was, I think I made the change because, as you said, I was, I was quite ill. And it was, uh, I was 23. I was right out of school, about six months. And I found myself sicker than anyone I, I knew or had ever been before. And so at the time, uh, as I mentioned to you offline, I, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, which was at least 40 years ago, was a medically conservative area. And we had conventional medicine. That's all I knew of. I didn't have any I didn't know anything else. Um, I mean, I grew up, I'd never heard of a chiropractor or naturopath or any, any, you know, anything except MD. And so I spent three years in medical care, getting worse all the time. And I finally realized three years in that medicine is really only about suppressing symptoms. That's all, that's all it's really intended to do. And I don't, you know, we don't need to, to go too far into that if you don't want to, but just a little bit. I mean, it wasn't always that way. Uh, things changed 110 years ago, when, 113 years ago, when the world's first billionaire, John D. Rockefeller, began investing in pharmaceutical companies. And medicine forever changed to be really about nothing more than selling pharmaceuticals. And this is probably obvious to you and many others listening, but toxic substances, pharmaceutical drugs are toxic substances, can't make you healthier. All they ever do is suppress symptoms, but because they're toxic, they have tons of potential, you know, sometimes very, very harmful and dangerous side effects. That's because of the toxicity of the substances. So you may feel better as they suppress symptoms, but you're actually becoming less healthy as a result. And so I finally woke up to that and I walked away from medicine and I never looked back. I, I didn't know where to turn. I had begun studying nutrition at 14 and I was, I was 26 by the time I walked away from medicine, so 12 years later, I went back and, and looked at the, the books and I was doing everything conventional nutrition said I should be doing. And yet I was sicker than anybody. I knew. And so I started to, to have some realizations about the validity of conventional nutrition. Um, again, I know from what I know about you that you're aware that much of what's out there in the conventional nutrition world, it's not really so valid. Um, there's a lot that's not valid at all. Um, and so, again, you know, I thought, okay. I mean, I had I tried in the meantime chiropractic and homeopathy and naturopathy and all kinds of other things. And, and nothing else helped me. Nothing made me well. Sometimes for a little while, suppressing symptoms. But, you know, again, um, as with taking antibiotics, because one of the one of the issues I was dealing with was ongoing sinus infection. Well, antibiotics work. Sinus infection goes away because they destroy the bacteria that you need to be healthy. Okay, that's what anti-against bio life antibiotics do. Um, we actually depend on 
bacteria. And uh, many people may not realize this, but you know that the age-old question, why are we here? Um, one answer might be to move bacteria around from point A to point B, right? We, because we have, it's estimated, 70 trillion cells in our bodies, but 700 trillion bacteria. So there are 10 times more of them than there is you, you know, in your own body. Uh, so we're, we're moving them around. And, you know, we can't really be healthy if we destroy the bacteria. They're actually a significant part of the body's immune function. And so... One of the things I did was I thought, well, nature has all the answers. I believe that firmly and still do. So I thought, what happens? You know, how do animals heal in nature? Well, it turns out that every animal in nature, when sick enough or badly, enough, in fact, domesticated animals will still do this. Your cat or dog, if sick enough or badly enough injured, will lie down and refuse to eat. And it seems crazy to most people. I mean, I remember the first time I read a book that talked about people going weeks without food. It seemed crazy to me, too. But the more I looked into it, the more sense it actually made. You know, the, the, the foundational piece, I think, that's important for everyone here to understand is that healing and, and detoxification, these are biological processes, which means only the body can heal the body. Okay, that's it. Uh, just remembering a, a lecture years ago in Belfast, Ireland, and I said there's only one thing on the planet. Speaking to a, you know 50 or 60 people, only one thing on this planet can heal your body. And a hopeful voice from the back of the room said, "You? No, not me. It's not me. I can't. I can't heal your body. But your body can when it has the right conditions and opportunity." And that's what fasting is. Fasting is, again, undertaken by every single one of nature's 25 million species. Okay, something that you and I instinctively did when we were kids, when we got sick enough, we lost our appetite. Now, chances are good that your mother and my mother both thought they were doing the right thing by making us eat because they thought that's what we needed to do. But our bodies knew better, okay? Processing food through the body takes so much energy that when the body actually needs to heal, the last thing it wants to have to do is to process food. And so I began fasting. I, I grew up with some exposure to fasting, uh, Jewish, but only on my parents' side. And so I would fasted one day every year. Apologize, this, this one keeps falling out. Um, I fasted one day a year, and I knew that was possible. There you are. Disappeared for a minute. Uh, I knew I could make it one day because I'd done that before, but I didn't really know if I could make it two days. And so I put parked myself close to the refrigerator just in case and tried fasting two days and then four days and then eight days. And within about a year, I was going 21 days at a time and amazing things happened. And even within six months, what I accomplished in six months was so powerful. You know, I, I've been a health coach now for 32 plus years. Uh, the Tanglewood Wellness Center is, has existed now for 27 and a half years. And I've worked with more than 15,000 clients personally. But I had no intention of being a health coach. I had no intention of, of any of this journey at the beginning. What happened was the changes in me were so dramatic that people who knew me would walk up to me if they hadn't seen me in a while, they'd say, oh, my God, you look amazing. What did you do? Can you help me? Can you help my child? Or can you help my partner? Can you help my, my grandparents? And before I knew it, I was running a commercial real estate company, but I was spending more time helping people with their health than I was running the business that actually paid the bills. I'm a little slow sometimes. It took me about five years to realize that was a bad way to pay the bills. And that's when I decided to become a full-time health coach. Um, so that's that's sort of, in a nutshell, what got me here. And, and along the way, I mean, one of the one of the first things that I realized around the time I, I learned about fasting, I started thinking, okay, so nutrition as it's being taught tells me that I need to eat animal products for the protein, and I need to, you know, consume X amount of grains. All the all this all these things, right? Back then, I think we had the four food groups. Um, you know, that's, it's morphed various times in, in our lives. But at some point I realized that 
what they were teaching didn't make any sense. And that, in fact, like nature's other 25 million species, who all have one species-specific natural diet for that species, it occurred to me that there must be a, a diet for our bodies as well. And as painful as it was to realize, because remember, this was all happening to me you know, shortly after college, what, what as painful as it was to realize, I, I, it occurred to me that it might not be pizza and beer. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I, I um, endeavored to figure out what it was. And one of the things that occurred to me, with even a little bit of study, it became really obvious that we're not meant to eat our products. It, it still baffles me how people argue that because it seems so clear to me. And so but, what made it clear? Well, uh, there's many things. I mean, we can start with the fact that um, carnivores and omnivores, the carnivore's jaw goes up and down only because they rip the flesh off the bone, swallow it whole, and digest it with no problem. Our jaws go up and down and side to side because we're made to chew up our food. They don't chew up their food, okay? Um, not only do they not chew it up, but as I said, they can they, they digest it. Well, you can see this. If you've ever seen a snake eat a mouse, okay? Carniv carnivorous snakes eat mice and other rodents, and they swallow the entire thing. And you can watch as that, as that giant lump disappears over the course of, what, a week maybe, something like that. They're digesting the entire animal, bones and all, okay? You and I eat one piece of corn, one kernel of corn, one sunflower seed, and don't chew it up, and what happens? We're going to see it again, okay? We, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things I, I've seen people who promote a carnivore-based diet saying is that, like the carnivores, we have the strongest stomach acid on the planet, okay? It's, it's hydrochloric acid, pH 1. It's 100,000 times stronger than water, more acidic than water. And they're right. However, they're also wrong because when we talk about acids, it doesn't matter what the pH of the acid is. That alone isn't the factor. What, to, what matters is the concentration measured in moles. And carnivores and omnivores stomach acid is 10 times as concentrated as yours and mine. Okay, that's how a carnivore can, can devour the entire thing and digest it all, and why you and I can't digest one sunflower seed, okay? So, you know, we, can, we start there. We look at our teeth. It's, it's funny. People say, well, we've got these, these canine teeth. Yeah, not really. I mean, if you ever played with a kitten and a kitten has nipped your finger, it will draw blood easily. That, and we're talking about a, a tiny animal with a with not very much jaw strength, okay? Anyone listening, you can put your finger under your canine tooth, bite down as hard as you're willing to, you're not gonna draw blood. I mean, you obviously could bite your finger off if you wanted to, but I'm not, not suggesting we do that. Um, it's just that we need a tremendous amount of force to, to cut through the finger when a carnivore, you know, it's a very different situation. Um, but there's many more things. If you look at the physiology, uh, carnivores, don't sweat. They pant to cool down, which is a very inefficient way to cool the body down. But they do it because they can't afford to telegraph to their prey where they are by their scent. Okay, we, we sweat to cool down. It's very efficient. But if we were carnivores, every one of our prey would know exactly where we are. Okay. Carnivores and most species on the planet, in fact, make vitamin C in their bodies. Okay. Vitamin C for them is not an essential nutrient. Essential nutrient, as you probably know from studying nutrition, an essential nutrient doesn't just mean that the body needs it. It means that the body needs it and can't make it, so has to consume it. Okay? Most species do not need to consume vitamin C because they make it in the body. All carnivores make it in the body. We don't make it in the body. Why not? Well, because it turns out that our natural diet is a it's a vegan diet but it's not just any vegan diet okay one of the things that occurred to me in addition to that we were not meant to eat animal products and by the way if you want to come back to that there's many more things about why we're not made to eat animals that are clear to me um but in fact i'll share one with you right now then i'll try to remember what i was saying we'll come back to it uh 
Carnivores have short, smooth, straight digestive tracts. So a 500-pound tiger has a digestive tract that's 12 feet long from mouth to the other end. The average human's digestive tract is 32 feet long. Okay, You're pretty petite, aren't you, Marikita? So I'm, I'm guessing a this 500-pound tiger is at least four times larger than you. And yet your digestive tract is two and a half times longer than its. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's because if you're eating a meat-based diet, you have to be able to get rid of the toxic byproducts as quickly as possible. Okay, so our systems, you know, if you've ever had a dog, you feed the dog, within an hour, two at the most, you have to take it. There goes the dinner. Okay, you and I, in the average human body, the transit time from one end to the other, it's four days. Now, let's be clear, most people aren't very healthy. Okay, 80% of the population dies of cancer, heart disease, or stroke. And nobody needs to. Nobody needs to have the, that outcome. In a healthy human body, and I've, I've helped more than 10,000 people take their health to an amazing new level. Again, I've worked with more than that, but not everyone's actually done what they need to do to, to get to that point. But those people who actually do what they need to, 8 to 12 hours from one end to the other. Not one hour, like a carnivore. Okay, not four days like the average person, eight to 12 hours. So it makes an enormous difference, all right? So let's back to vitamin C. We don't make it in the body because there's a law of nature called the law of efficiency. And the law of efficiency says that every organism strives to be as efficient as possible to get the most outcome for the smallest amount of effort, of energy expended. So it would make no sense for our bodies to make vitamin C like most animal bodies do when we're meant to eat it every day. If you eat a diet that we're actually meant for, which I would suggest, you know, in this, this sounds crazy to many people for many reasons, but, you know, if you consider the fact that if we looked at a cow and a sheep and a goat, and we could, let's say they had a glass panel on their side, we could see their digestive tract. We might not have any idea what they ate if they weren't in the process of eating. But we would know that they all three of them shared a very similar diet. Why? Because they have virtually the same digestive tract. Okay? So the digestive tract of every species is specialized for its particular diet. Ant eaters eat ants. Uh, tigers eat, eat meat. Um, Sheep, goats, and, and, and uh, cows eat grass and little green plants. Each of these species needs the same nutrients. Each of them is able to extract those nutrients from their particular diet. No species does well on some other species diet because it doesn't have the digestive tract adapted for that. Okay, and this is why so many people get sick. It's not lack of nutrients. Most people are getting all the nutrients they need no matter what they're eating. Almost every diet will provide the nutrients into the body. Now they might not be accessing and they might not be able to use them properly. It's not because they're not there. It's because their body is not properly adapted for the diet that they're eating. If we look at our digestive physiology, it's virtually identical to that of a chimpanzee or bonobo. And if that's surprising, consider that we share over 99% of our DNA with these animals. Our digestive tracts are almost identical. What do they eat? Well, they live in the tropical jungle, and they eat almost exclusively fruit as long as there's enough fruit available to them. Okay, um, they also eat leaves. And it's interesting because the only real difference between our, our systems and theirs is their uh, colon, the large intestine, is proportionally a little bit longer than the small. And that gives them the ability to digest roughage better than we can. And that's important if you live in the jungle because there's not a lot of lettuce growing in the jungle. They have to eat trees off of leaves and other plants, which sometimes are much denser and more fibrous than the things that our bodies are now best adapted to. Okay, and you want to be clear, we're best adapted to lettuce and other very soft, tender leaves. We don't do well with some of the denser leaves. And again, I know this is surprising, and this is counter to what many people have heard. Okay, and so, for instance, um, kale, cabbage, collard greens, broccoli, these are superfoods by many people's opinions because they have tons of nutrients, and they do. That's absolutely true. 
but how many nutrients something has isn't the best determinant of whether we should be consuming it or not. Okay. There, there's a well-known vegan MD who, who calls himself uh, a nutrivore. And the idea is to get it the new, most nutrient dense foods possible. The problem is, is we don't digest most nutrient dense foods very well. So there are studies that look at this. They, they take people, they feed them a specific serving size of kale or uh, broccoli. I'm trying to remember which ones they've tested. They've tested various different greens. And what they do, as, as you may know, we need vitamin A. And by the way, this is one of the, one of the ways that people who promote an animal-based diet say, well, we have to eat animal products because there's no vitamin A in, in produce. And they're right. There's no vitamin A in produce. But there are something like 2 million vegetarian animal species on the planet. All of them need vitamin A. How do they get it? Well, what they do is they eat plants that contain carotenes. And both orange fruits and, and uh, well, really fruits, we're talking about um, uh, carrots, of course, vegetables. Okay. So orange fruits and vegetables, carrots, peaches, mangoes, papayas, um, red, yellow, orange peppers, all of these foods contain carotenes, but also dark green leafy vegetables contain carotenes. Okay. And so what they do is they, it's called vitamin A equivalency units. How much vitamin A could you get from this quantity of carotenes? They call that vitamin A because that's what we're looking for, right? the vitamin A. So they measure the vitamin A equivalency units, then they feed that serving of, of the food, kale, for instance, to 100 people, and then they measure how much vitamin A was the body able to produce as a result of that consumption. They take the same people at a different date, and they feed them a specific serving of papaya. I think what they've tested are papayas and mangoes. And then they measure how much vitamin A showed up in the body as a result of consuming that food. The interesting thing is the average person got twice as much vitamin A from eating the fruit as they did from eating the leafy greens. Okay, but here's the most interesting part. The serving of leafy greens that they used, that they were fed, contained twice as much vitamin A equivalency as the fruit. So what that means is it's four times easier to get it from the fruit than it is the leafy greens. Why? Well, what these cruciferous vegetables have in common is they're high in cellulose and other complex starches that we can't digest. And so if the nutrients are bound up in these fibers we can't digest, guess what? We don't get a lot of those nutrients into the body. Okay, so the fact that something is loaded with nutrients doesn't really matter to us. If we can't get the nutrients, why does it make any difference how much is there? Okay, and so what I eat and recommend eating is fruit and soft tender leaves. And when we do that, we see amazing things happen. Yeah. Now, I know the questions, the criticisms that come. So maybe I can head some of those off. And then if you like, we can, we can talk about fasting, which you know, is amazing uh, in another sense. Um, one of the things people say was, well, hang on. If we're eating most fruit, there's too much sugar, right? Well, there's lots of sugar. First of all, let's take a step back. What does our body run on? What's the primary fuel? Do you know? Carbohydrates. Fiber. <laughs> well, actually, we can't digest fiber. So to run on something, we have to actually be able to break it down. It's, it's carbohydrates, you're right. And some people might say, well, the best we can do is bread and grains and pastas. But all starches, these are all starchy foods, all starches are complex carbohydrates. And there's a simple carbohydrate that makes up the building block. That is, that's what they're made of. What they're made of is sugar. And what the body runs on is glucose. Okay? In fact, this sort of ties us back to fasting because when we stop eating, what is the one thing the body is looking for in the absence of food coming? Sugar. Sugar is our primary fuel. So when we stop eating, what the body does is it says, okay, where can I get sugar from? There's no food coming Okay, and what it does first is it goes to the liver where we store glycogen, which is a glucose precursor. The body can take this glycogen easily. It's, it's a storage form of glucose. 
and we can't we don't want to store too much sugar in the body because that causes problems right if our blood sugar is too high that's diabetes and so what the body does is it takes the excess sugar and it stores it in the liver as glycogen so that when we need it we can convert it back to sugar we also store glycogen in the muscles but we don't use muscle glycogen in the absence of food and the re at least not right away and the reason why is because we need we need that muscle glycogen in order to get food when the time comes so let me give you an example so it's easy to understand polar bears everyone knows that bears hibernate polar bears do not hibernate but female polar bears when pregnant they'll build themselves a den they'll go down underground right when they're ready to birth their cubs they birth two cubs at a time they birth these two cubs they're mammals which means they have mammary glands they their cubs feed on breast milk only for the first five months so they go in they birth these two cubs and mama feeds them the milk from her own body while she's consuming nothing no food no water nothing at all okay she lives off of her own fat okay uh, muscle is minimally affected there's a tiny amount of muscle consumption because as is true in our bodies our our brains our reproductive organs and our spleens require sugar where the whole bot rest of the body can run on ketones which is a breakdown of, of fat a metabolic uh, product of fat metabolism we can all everything can run on fat ketones except for those three systems and so we, there's a tiny amount of muscle that's going to be converted to sugar throughout the process but they lose almost no muscle mass now when they come out it's time for a meal right there's only one problem where they build their den on average for and i don't know why but they, i'm sure they've got reasons on average is 75 miles away from the feeding ground so before before now the the, the cubs have been feeding and growing quickly. Um, I don't know their growth rate. I know a human baby triples in size roughly in the first year. If, if a, a bear cub does the same thing, they've already grown quite a bit on mama's milk. They're, they're okay. They're, you know, they're, they've, they've been exercising, moving around. They've got the strength. But mama's consumed nothing. And so her body doesn't use the muscle glycogen as fuel initially because she's going to need it later on to be able to move from where her den is to where the feeding ground is. And our bodies do the same thing. If you're injured in the tropical jungle and you can't move and you can't get food because you can't walk, your body is going to conserve your muscle glycogen so that when the time comes, you have the strength to go find food, climb a tree to pick the fruit you need. Okay, it's not, you know, it's in nature, there's not a lot of refrigerators and, um, you know, in cell phones to call someone to deliver to you. So you have to be able to go find it yourself. Okay, and so we, we conserve muscle glycogen for that reason. How's this all sounding so far? Wow, I mean, it's sounding very informative and very useful information to pass on to other people, definitely. And, um, well, I had some questions. No, I, but I, I think about when I don't feel well, when I'm sick, I don't want to eat. You know, I mean, all that time, every time I feel sick, I just don't want to eat. And it makes sense what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the thing to consider is this, you know, people say, well, you need food to heal. You need food to be strong. You don't actually. Our bodies store fat specifically so that in the absence of food, because in nature, sometimes there are fires and floods and droughts, and, you know, various conditions. It might not be so easy to find food in nature. Okay, and so we store fat on the body so that we can survive in the absence of food. When we are not well and the body doesn't want to use its energy to process food, which some people say takes more than half the body's energy, we conserve that energy by not eating and we live off of our fat reserves. And so, and it's crazy because we fast people all the time who are so thin, most people would say, no, there's no way that person could skip lunch let alone fast 21 days. Uh, for instance, uh, as, I don't know if you've seen my YouTube channel, but I have over a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. 
Um, nothing new since January because we were hacked and I haven't been able to get back in there yet. But the woman who did the last four years of video production for me came to me as a client six and a half years ago. She was a type 1 diabetic but didn't know it. She never had her blood sugar tested. Um, when she showed up at Tanglewood, we tested, among other things, we, you know, we check all the vital signs every day. We checked her blood sugar, and her blood sugar was like 250, 275. As you may know, it should be, medicine says it should be between 70 and 100. I believe it should be between 60 and 90. But hers was 275, so it was nearly three times as high as medicine says is okay. And it was that way almost every day at first. And then it went down as a result of fasting. Interestingly, it stayed down as a result of uh, fasting and living on a fruit-based diet. So again, people think, well, too much sugar. Fruits actually have, now most of you, most people listening have probably heard of the glycemic index. But most people don't know what it is. I'm curious, you know, I, I, I know you're, I hope it's okay to say this. You told me about the st- course you're taking right now, right? Um, T. Colin Campbell's right. course. And mm-hmm. um, I, I've known Colin Campbell for a long time. He's an amazing guy. And I'm sure he's aware of this. But most people, I hear nutritionists and doctors talking about the glycemic index, and they don't know what it is. They think it's a reflection of how much that food is going to affect your blood, blood sugar. It's not. All the glycemic index tells you is how quickly a substance makes its carbohydrates available to the body. So, for instance... I had the woman I'm talking about and another male volunteer for a while together. She lived on site for four years. But I had another guy who was there for about six months, I think. He was also type 1 diabetic. The one fruit that had the least impact on their blood sugar was the only high glycemic index fruit we had. It had the least impact. Okay, That's because glycemic index has nothing to do with the impact on blood sugar. Impact, glycemic index means... Carbohydrates are readily available. What would that be? It was watermelon. Mm. Watermelon Watermelon has a high glycemic index, about 72. Most doctors and nutritionists would tell diabetics to stay away from watermelon. Watermelon has less impact on most people's blood sugar than any other fruit. And most fruits don't have much impact. But watermelon has less. Why? Because it's 92% water. It has some fiber. It has relatively little sugar. Okay? So the fact that it makes its carbohydrates available to the body quickly doesn't affect us much if there isn't much sugar there. You could have something else that, that had a much lower glycemic index, which means a slower release of sugar into the bloodstream, but much more sugar, and it would have much more impact. So someone realized some years back that the glycemic index alone didn't really tell us very much, and they came up with something called glycemic load. Glycemic load takes the glycemic index and multiplies it times the percentage of calories from sugar in that food. A percentage of the food, which, so if you have 100 grams of watermelon, how many grams of sugar are there? And when you multiply those two, you get a completely different table. So the glycemic index is zero to 100, with 100 being white sugar, processed sugar, and white bread, which is just the same. Because you have all that carbohydrate, no fiber, what happens? It all converts into sugar. It has the same impact on your blood. You know, it roughly will have the same impact. Okay, so a very quick release of sugar into the bloodstream with white bread or white sugar. When we look at fruits, though, we look at the glycemic load, we have the chart isn't 0 to 100. It's, it's uh, 0 to 9 is low, 10 to 19 is moderate, 20 and above is high. Most fruits, most fresh fruits, have a low glycemic load. And this is actually predictive of impact on blood sugar. And again, they have a low impact on blood sugar because the water and the fiber in fresh fruits slows down the absorption of sugar in the bloodstream. Now, this is going to surprise many people, but you know, everyone thinks juices are the most amazing thing on the planet, right? When you take the fiber away, you roughly triple the glycemic load of that substance. So carrot juice, orange juice, apple juice, drive your blood sugar up much more than eating the whole food. Okay, juices aren't really particularly healthy. If they're green juices, they're exceptionally concentrated in protein because leafy greens are about 50% protein. And that's not a problem as long as we're eating the food. 
The problem is, is we can consume far more in juice than we can in food. I, I have, this isn't really the best example. It's, it's not a bad example. But I had just given a lecture outside of Washington, D.C. many years ago. And a woman uh, raised her hand. She had some questions. I answered her questions. And then I said to her, you drink a lot of carrot juice, don't you? She said, yeah, how do you know? I said, well, you're orange. This isn't so orange, but her skin was orange. Um, and she said, oh, that's because I'm detoxifying. And I responded to her. I said, you know, I, I run the world's largest water only fasting center. And which is the most powerful way to detoxify your body. No one's ever turned orange. Okay. Turning orange is not evidence of detoxification. It's evidence that you're taking in more carotenes than your liver can handle. That's not useful. Okay. As, as you may know, you know, to make a big glass of carrot juice takes a lot of carrots. Way more than you would ever eat at one time. I mean, I don't know about you, Marikita. I, you know, I think if I tried to eat, I mean, I, I, I would get past that first big bunny love carrot, you know, organic carrots. I get one of those in. I start to eat the second one. My jaw would say something like, Lauren, you're on your own. Good luck. I'm done. You know, have a good time. I'm out, I'm out of here. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of chewing. So, you know, we would never eat that much. The same is true with leafy greens. Studies show that if we eat... Uh, three heads of lettuce at a time. We're getting as much protein as in the serving of meat. That's too much. That's too much. I mean, there was a paper published last year that said that if 30% of your calories come from animal proteins, you have three times the risk of most diseases. Okay, three times the risk, almost all diseases. But if 30% of, of your calories come from plant proteins, you still have twice the risk of these diseases. So excess protein is never beneficial to us. Okay, we need tiny, tiny amounts of protein. And most people, most adults, get about 10 times as much as they actually need, even more sometimes. Okay, um, we need very, very little protein to build muscle and stay healthy. Now, let's say, and I think this is probably true about you, I don't know, but I'm guessing that you actually want to be a professional bodybuilder. Is that true? Is that your number one goal in life? <laughs> a professional bodybuilder? Well, I don't think not today. No, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, man. <laughs> if if you wanted to be a bodybuilder, you wanted to have unnaturally large muscles, you would have to eat excess protein. Okay, but it's useful to know that bodybuilders don't live very long. Okay, doing that to yourself—that's not a good thing for various reasons. And again, let's let's bust another. Um, misconception okay right now one of the things that that happens if you're a bodybuilder excess muscle the more muscle you have the higher your metabolism is most people would say well that's a good thing you want to build muscle so you can speed up you can raise your metabolism right that's what everybody believes why do you think everyone believes that because they want to lose weight exactly if your metabolism is higher you lose weight or you can eat more without gaining weight right but what it really means, you have a car, I'm, I'm guessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many miles to the gallon do you get? Roughly. Any uh, idea? 25. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if we could make some adjustments to your car so you could get 12 and a half miles to the gallon? I don't know about that. 12 and a half? Want, you wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> 12 that, and a half? <laughs> that would be raising your car. That would be doubling your car's metabolism. Uh, okay. Double the metabolism means that you need twice as much fuel to do the same amount of work. Why would anyone want to do that? That would be to make your body much less efficient. Okay. Now, if we look at this in real, real life, okay, real world terms, um, I'm going to guess you weigh 120 pounds, 110. You don't have to say if you don't want to. No, 125. Okay. Somewhere all around right. there. All right. All right. So, so let's say you're a hummingbird. Okay. Marikita, the giant hummingbird. Okay. If you were a hummingbird, you would need to eat roughly 125 pounds of food per day. Mm. That's a lot. Okay? That's a they lot. Eat, they eat their body weight in food every day. And that's because the intense level of activity. A hummingbird will flap its wings 
up to 70 times per second. Now think about that. I mean, I don't know if there's anything you can do quickly, like, you know, can you snap your fingers quickly? <laughs> Not that I fast. <laughs> I can't snap my fingers twice in a second. Okay, and they flap their wings up to 70 times in one second. That requires a tremendous amount of fuel. So they have a very high metabolism. Guess which bird has the shortest lifespan? Oh, the, hum the hummingbird, huh? The higher the metabolism, the shorter the lifespan. Okay, what we want to do, I mean, and I'm not talking about slowing your metabolism down to the point that you can't move. I'm talking about being incredibly energetic, having tons of, of energy, being able to do anything you want to, but having your metabolism no higher than necessary. And it's interesting because although they don't necessarily talk about in this in these terms, the only thing that longevity experts agree on, you take you take 10 people focused on longevity, experts, you know, PhDs, and this is their field. What's the one thing that people need to do to live as long as possible? They'll all tell you the same thing. They may not agree on what to eat. They may not agree on how much sleep we need or whether it's okay to drink or smoke. They may not agree on how much sunlight we need or how much activity we need. The one thing they agree on is that we should eat no more food than necessary. Oh, yeah. Right. Every one of them says minimize your caloric intake. You eat what you need and no more than that. Well, in order to do that, we need to slow our metabolism down. So we I'm need less food. Exactly. Exactly. So that we need less food. Yeah. That ensures that we age as, as slowly as possible. Because remember, processing food takes more energy than anything else we do. So if we're spending a lot of energy processing food, we're, we're going to age more quickly, more rapidly. Now, there are some things we can do. Number one thing we can do to slow that down, you might be aware of telomeres. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done any wiring? No. Ever rewire a lamp? Okay. Oh. So if when you, when you connect two electric cables together, what you'll do, Let's say we're talking about very simple wiring. You've got the the red and the black, or the black and the white wires, right? If they're if they're color coded, so you'll take the two white ones and you'll twist them together with a pair of pliers, and then you'll take a little plastic cap and screw it on there, and you'll do the same thing with the other wires, and then you'll tape the whole thing up so the caps can't fall off easily. Those caps prevent the wires that you've twisted together from unraveling and causing a problem, causing a short circuit. So telomeres is kind of like that little plastic cap on our DNA. What they tell us is our DNA are, are it's twisted helix. It's two strands. They're wrapped around each other. And the cap, the telomere, prevents that from unraveling. Now, as we age, when we're born, the telomeres are very long. As we age, they get shorter and shorter. There are a couple of things that we can do to lengthen them again. Here's good news. One of the things we can do to lengthen our telomeres is sex. They say that having sex, actually making love, actually lengthens. And I'm, I'm, my guess is it's making love, not having sex. You know, I, I'm guessing it has to be love. But the, the only thing that lengthens the telomeres as much as possible, the greatest impact, is fasting. Mm. When we stop eating, those telomeres become longer. We literally become younger. Okay, physiologically younger. And it's, it's amazing the things that we see happen with people when they fast. Okay? So, again, why this happens. Processing food takes all this energy. We stop eating and we rest as completely as we can. This is the way to fast. We rest as completely as possible. When we do that, our body can now put most of its energy into the processes of cleansing and healing. Okay, and so when we do that, we see incredible things happen. Now, let me give you a few examples. You are, well, your grandmother is old enough to know that as people get older, they often have hypertension, high blood pressure, right? Um, this affects most people over 50. And if, if anyone is, has ever been diagnosed with hypertension, they will be told by a doctor that you'll need to take this medication for the next two or three weeks, right? Next two or three weeks. For the rest of your life. Forever. Forever. <laughs> the, rest, the rest of their life. Yeah. Exactly. What they're, what they're saying to you is, 
this isn't going to heal anything. They, they don't heal hypertension with drugs. What they do is they control symptoms. Oh, look, I've got better numbers. Isn't that nice? Okay, that doesn't make you live longer. People don't live any longer when they take hypertensive medication. Statistically, they have no effect. Now, by the way, you should know that the, the world around pharmaceuticals is pretty dishonest. Okay, again, their goal is to put your money in their bank account. So they want you to think they work. So when they do studies on these hypertensive drugs, they typically study people 45 and under. 45 and under. Who uses most of these medications? People that are over 50. Older people. But they don't, they, they prevent older people from getting into the studies. If you look at what actually happens in older bodies with these drugs, people don't get healthier at all. In fact, again, these are toxic substances that have terrible side effects. Okay. And so they're not, they're not eliminating the cause of the problem. We can't eliminate the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem, the primary cause of the problem is plaque in the arteries, atherosclerosis. Mm. Okay. When we fast, the body gets rid of that plaque. It breaks it down. So in 27 and a half years that we've been fasting people with hypertension, more than a thousand people, we have 100% success. We have 99.99. We had one guy in his late 70s who came to us with blood pressure of 172 over I forget what. When he finished, excuse me, it was one. Yeah, it was one 170 something. When he finished, it was one. It was 50 points lower. It was 120 something. So he still had technically his blood pressure was higher than normal. Everybody else. We take their blood pressure to below normal, every single person. Okay, this is the one guy that left, finished, still a couple of points high, but statistically he had reduced his risk of heart disease, heart attack, or stroke by a hundred percent. Statistically, that's amazing. Yeah, and um, how long? So how long would would that take? I mean, how long is a normal fast? If someone was coming to you from mm -hmm. your center, like what would be the beginning fast? Well. The beginner fast, you know, this is a fast with training wheels for someone who's never done it before, is typically no longer than 42 days. Okay, and here, see, here's the thing. It doesn't matter if it's your first one or your, your 15th one. Our bodies were set up to fast safely, as was every other species on the planet. So, I, in fact, I started to tell you, and I, I do this, where you know, so many so many interesting things here were jumping around. The woman who came to me with, hyperten with uh, diabetes whose blood sugar was so high. She's 5'7". She's pretty tall. When she first arrived, the first time to fast, she weighed 88 pounds. 88 pounds, wow. <laughs> she fasted for 21 days. Her blood sugar was much lower when she was done. She's now fasted with me five times. Every time she's done this, it's gotten better. Uh, A1C is a measure of blood sugar over the last three months. The last time she was tested for A1C, they said to her, you're now pre-diabetic. You don't have diabetes anymore. She, I had another client have the exact same outcome six months ago. That's two clients within a year. Ceased to become, as far as medicine is concerned, no longer diabetic. Okay? This is what's possible. We have 100% success, by the way, with type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is much harder. As you're probably right. aware, type, type 2 is insulin resistance. Type 1 is insulin dependence, or the body's not making enough insulin. So that's right. what we're talking about. And you're, you're treating the, you're not treating the symptoms. That's the difference. Right? I mean, you're treating no, no. the root, right? Well, to, to, be, to be as clear as possible, we're not treating anything. You know, you're going back to natural state. All we're doing is we're saying, hey, Make yourself comfortable. Okay, rest as completely as you can. But your dog or cat won't move while it's fasting. And with a large dog, this could be weeks or even a month or more with a big dog. Now, cats and small dogs won't, won't fast. But, but um, our bodies, the average person could fast for eight weeks if they did it properly. The longest recorded fast in history was 382 days. More than a year. No food. My longest client fast was four and a half months. 
This was a young man, 29 years old, with stage four testicular cancer. When he was finished, there was no trace of cancer. Now that sounds crazy to people, but but you know before before you you think this guy's crazy and he's a quack, listen listen to something. Science tells us that every human body, yours and mine, are creating cancer cells every day. When the body is healthy enough, it destroys those cells. Our body's immune function says, oh, that cell is not okay, and it gets rid of it. Okay, there's, there's something called autophagy. Autophagy is, means, is from Greek, auto, self, phagy, eat. So the body actually consumes the damaged tissue, including these cancer cells, uses whatever it can and gets rid of the rest. Okay? It's interesting, but there was a, a um, Nobel Prize winning scientist from Japan named Yoshinori Yosumi, who won the 2016 Nobel Prize for Medicine. He's actually the man who coined the term autophagy. And what he proved was that this happens much more effectively, much more efficiently in the absence of food. So when we fast, the body's able to crank the autophagy way up and do this as quickly as possible. So while most of you are probably aware that cancer treatments, medical cancer treatments, are in most cases are, are probably more harmful with cancer. I, mean, I think more people probably die from chemo and radiation than from the cancer itself. We have great success with fasting. Not everyone. Obviously, when it's advanced enough, sometimes the body has trouble getting on top of it. it may not be able to do it. And there's no guarantees. I can't say to someone, I can guarantee you're going to be 100% healthy. Maybe not. In some cases, it may be too late. But Healing is a biological process. So the very best thing we can do is to get out of the body's way and allow the body to heal itself. Okay, and that's what happens when we fast long enough and properly. So the average fast at Tanglewood is 26 days on just one. That's average. Um, we Every year we'll fast about between two and 300 people. And almost all of them, uh, maybe out of that group, I'll have maybe 10 clients that do less than 21 days on water. Okay, that's a four week process. 21 days on water, seven days of refeeding. Okay, but like this last session, maybe a little more than usual, we had one guy, a 77 year old who did 40 days, his first half. We had a 62 year old who 45 days. We had a 26-year-old do 47 days. We had a 36-year-old do 42 days. And I have a man in his 40s right now who is currently on day 37. No, I take that back, 35. 35 days. Um, maybe 36. I lose track. So uh, many of these people are fasting for the first time. It doesn't matter. The body knows what to do. Now, people, don't, we don't know what to do. And that's why it's important, critically important, to have experience guidance. You know, I, I would, for me, it's kind of like childbirth. Do you, do you have children, Marikita? No? No, no humans. I mean. No human children. <laughs> right. You got, fuzz, you got fuzzy kids. Yeah. I got, I got it. I got it. Um, my mother had a fuzzy kid too, but that's me. <laughs> so most women still give, give birth to their babies in hospitals. And even the ones that don't usually have a doula or somebody who has a lot of experience guiding them through the process. It's a completely natural process. But Everyone wants to be sure that it's done properly and safely, and so most people have some help. In the same way, fasting is a completely natural process. But unless you've grown up in a family and in a culture where everybody fasts, and I, I'm not talking about, by the way, um, in the Muslim tradition. You know, in my YouTube videos, you'll see many Muslims saying, oh, yeah, we've been doing this forever. Well, that's completely different. You know, the, the annual fast for Ramadan, is a fast from sunrise to sunset. Muslims eat twice a day during Ramadan. 
the two worst times of the day when it's dark, before the sun comes up and after the sun comes down. We should not be eating before sunrise or after sunset, but that's what they do. And the average Muslim today gains weight while in their Ramadan fast. Okay? That makes when sense. You, when you're actually fasting, you lose weight because your body is using its own tissue for fuel. Muslims aren't doing that. What they're doing is not really. It's more like an intermittent fast with the very worst timing possible, in my opinion. Okay, I mean, I, I couldn't think of a worse way to do that. Intermittent fasting, by the way, is very powerful, but it's nowhere near as powerful. It's, you know, the idea with intermittent fasting, it's not that fasting for 16 hours or however many it is, is powerful for you. Fasting is powerful that way, not because there's a lot of power in 16 hours, but because everyone benefits by eating less food and less frequently. Because the digestive tract occupies so much of our energy, we don't want to engage it any more than we need to. So I'm pretty energetic today, but I haven't eaten anything since, what's today? Tuesday? Since Sunday. Well, you're looking good. You're looking very lively. I feel good. I feel great. I've been working most of the day. I have a set of calls. I, I'm spending four or five hours on Zoom calls every day. Um, I usually exercise, not today, but... Um, and it wasn't, I didn't plan to fast. It's not, I mean, I wouldn't normally plan this while I'm driving, while I'm, you know, while I'm traveling. And it's, it's just, I was so busy. I, I was on the road. I found a place to stay. There was no place nearby to get anything to eat. And I didn't really have much time. And so I, I just didn't eat. Um, it shouldn't be difficult. You know, I, I, many people, probably some of the people listening are thinking, yeah, if I skip lunch, I feel terrible. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. You know, I had something I've always said to people is the harder it is to skip a meal, the more meals you probably need to skip. What happens when you skip lunch is your body begins to detoxify, which for most people only happens while they're asleep. And when we wake up in the morning, your armpits may not smell so good. Your breath may be a little funky. That's because your body's been detoxifying overnight. Okay. When you skip meals, your body is detoxifying while you're awake. It may not feel so good. Okay. When your body's clean enough, skipping a meal is no big deal. That's how it should be. It should be that, yeah, we eat if we can find food. And if we don't find food, it's not really a big deal. We can easily go, I mean, I can go five or six days without eating anything and feel perfectly fine. Okay. Well, wow, no this is very inspirational. Yeah, <laughs> it is very, very inspirational. I was, you know, I, since I told you that I was taking that the nutrition class, the um, E. Cornell, T. Colin Campbell, and he talking about giving your body rest, right? Eating all the time and your body never gets a chance to rest and how that detrimental exactly. that is. Exactly. Well, you know, uh, Colin, Colin Campbell knows, knows very well about this. When I first met him, 30 years ago, he was suffering from, oh, now the name just lost my, uh, Bell's palsy. Oh. Half of his face was frozen. I had a friend that he just said that. He would talk like this. He eliminated that. He healed that via fasting for 21 days. Wow. Um, he, he's well aware of the power of fasting. He's really an amazing guy. It's a great course you're taking. I'm excited, um, Yeah. And I'm excited about everything you've taught us. And I see that we're actually coming to an hour, but I want to, it seems like we didn't talk about, I mean, you gave me so much information. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, I'm, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but I, I have somewhere I have to be in five days. So I can only no. stay for five more days. That's it. <laughs> actually, when they close here at nine o'clock, they're going to throw me out. So I'm going to, we're going to have to end by then. No, I, we, I'm sure we could talk about this forever. Um, we could, but let, let's find out. I want everybody to know where they can tell us about your your um, your wellness place in Costa Rica and tell us how we can get there. Sure. Uh, probably the easiest thing to do would be to go to TanglewoodWellnessCenter.com. Perhaps you can provide links. It here. should be in the description. Okay. TanglewoodWellnessCenter.com. There's all the information there, including prices and rates and sessions. We operate in sessions so that we are... We're not always open currently. We, we were when we opened. After I did this for a while, it's, it's pretty intense. And so I decided I needed to have breaks. I'm now in the process of cloning, attempting to clone myself. Um, I've got a doctor coming on staff and a second one who will be joining us uh, later in the year. 
and we're going to start publishing um, research because we have tons of data. That, you know, I mean, all the things I'm telling you, we can back by, by research, and there's so much more. I mean, I, I wish we had time to share all the things that we've seen because it's truly amazing what happens. You know, people often think, well, it's too late, my body can't heal. You, know, you mentioned people who had uh, terribly gnarled fingers, I think, before we went live. My mother fasted with me when she was 70, and she suffered from terrible arthritis for, at that point, for like 35, 38 years from her early 30s, early to mid 30s. She was on painkillers every single day. She eliminated half of this figurement and had no pain without painkillers for the first time after fasting. Um, we've seen the same thing with many clients where they eliminate their arthritis even after more than 20 years. People can eliminate the pain. Okay, there are really very, very few things that the body isn't capable of healing when it has the right conditions and opportunities. So that's what we focus on at Tanglewood. Um, we're open currently about 35 or 36 weeks a year, but that's going to be changing over the next year. We're going to be going to a schedule where we're, we'll be open most of the time, more like probably 46 to 48 weeks a year. Well, wonderful. That's that's very, I mean, we, like you had said before, I mean, it's up to us that we, I hope that shh, everybody be quiet, <laughs> that, I mean, we are in charge of our bodies. We can come back and not to give up that, what, yeah. you know, right? We, well, we've got to take action. You know, in fact, let me, let me share just a, a couple personal details with you. I told you I got very sick at 23 and at 26, I walked away from medicine. I'm 62 now. I haven't been sick one day since I took over my own health journey. So it's now been 36 years, roughly, without a day sick. I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy in my early 20s, 18 to, to 20, basically. I left there because of a congenital knee defect that I wasn't aware of until I turned 19. Around my 19th birthday, I started having trouble with my knees, and they, the Air Force wanted to operate on both my knees. Now, this was back in the early 80s. And back then, you might recall, you would see professional basketball players who would damage the knee, and they would go in and do these surgeries every other year. And I thought, no, there's no way I'm setting myself for surgery after surgery after surgery. I said to them, when I can't walk, I'll think about surgery. Until then, no chance in the world. And they said, okay. Well, you, you're disqualified from flight training, which is why I went there in the first place. I thought it'd be sexy to fly, fly jets. So I left the Air Force Academy. At the time, it's, it's located, as you may know, in Colorado Springs, and I love to ski. So I would ski whenever I got the chance while I lived there for two years. But I had to wear big braces on my knees with, with metal hinges to support my knees because I couldn't ski them. Seven years ago at 55, I thought, okay, I've been body surfing my entire life, surfing, just using my body. And I thought, I want to learn how to surf a surfboard. So I started taking surfing lessons. Now, I don't spend a lot of time on surfboards, but I can surf now, same action as skis, without needing braces at 62, something I couldn't do when I was 18, 19. Okay, so my body literally works better today than it did at 19. This is possible for everyone, almost everyone. I mean, it's amazing what can happen. If, in fact, we've had many clients lose their glasses. Wow. <laughs> I'm the only one. I'm the only one in my family. I've got, I've got three sisters, um, both my parents, and three half siblings, all wear glasses. I'm the only one that still has better than 2020 vision. And I'm the third oldest in the family of seven kids. That's amazing. I mean, this is we can never give up and it's very important to share this information and to take action for ourselves and to try new things my gosh we're so trapped in these habits and the way that we're taught i mean it, that we have to eat all the time that <laughs> like when we get sick we got to eat chicken soup and all this stuff that's not even i mean goodness sakes so yeah uh, this has been so informative i'm you know, very grateful for this. And Lauren, I really, I encourage everybody that's watching now and on the replay to please reach out and check out Lauren's website. And you have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. Again, there's no new videos because I've been locked out. We got, we got uh, hacked and haven't been able to get back in there. But there's 
over a thousand videos there touching every aspect of health. And, you know, I, I, I've become a fasting expert um, de facto, having now fa taken more people through long fasts than any other individual currently alive. But having said that, fasting is just one tool. You know, my goal really, Marakita, I believe that every single person listening, not the people who aren't, aren't listening, not them, but everyone listening has genius. Literally, every single human being has genius. Most people, unfortunately, never come close to manifesting everything they're capable of manifesting because they're not healthy. I mean, how can you manifest everything you're capable of if you don't have energy? You know, I, I hear from people every single day. They've got brain fog and they have, they have fatigue and they can barely get through the day. And, um, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, there's, there's no reason you can't feel better than you've ever felt in your entire life if you're willing to do what you need to do. It's amazing. Our bodies can, can heal almost anything if you give them a chance. Well, amen to that. I, I believe you. And I want everybody that's listening, please, to listen. I mean, really hear this and believe and take action. Don't ever give up. We are the solution. Your body will heal itself. So. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us from Texas. You are very welcome. Good luck on the travels. And thanks, everybody, for watching. JJ is saying this is packed with great info. Yeah, amen to that. And JJ, thanks for introducing. Thanks, JJ. Yeah, <laughs> this has really been wonderful. So I hope you have a wonderful afternoon again. And um, be safe out there. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Marikita. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye, everybody.